we can all all would really be an act of worship for us. That from the beginning to the end, we would have a sense of the worthiness of God. And that something of the majesty of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, would dawn upon our souls. We come, eternal Lord, and give thanks. The Lord's kindness to us in many, many ways, even this day itself. How poorly we repay that kindness, and how little thought we give to the one who gives us so richly. We confess, O oh Lord, that amongst our other sins, we are cold and careless when it comes to the Lord, that instead of being warm, we are cold, instead of being near, we drift far away. Instead of having our minds fixed upon the things that matter, so much of our time and energy is taken up with things that don't matter at all, passing fleeting things of this life, that in the light of the great eternity are really irrelevant. O oh Lord, we pray that as we gather even tonight, there will be a refocusing of our thoughts and of our priorities, and that we would see that one thing is needful, and that having seen that, we would be enabled, each one of us, to make choice of that one good thing that shall not be taken from it. There are many perils that, 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 that are in this world, many treasures to seek out, the Bible speaks of one pearl of great price, priceless indeed. And that is what we are to press and to look for. Our Lord, we pray that we would see that Christ is that priceless treasure, and that if we have him, we would be thankful tonight, and that we would treasure him for four years, and we would begin this week working him. Praising him, thanking him, desiring to follow him, to honor him, to serve him, to reflect his grace in our own lives. And if we conclude that we do not have, that we would come with hearts tonight that seek him with, our, with, with all of our being, that our half heartedness would be taken away, and that whether we are young or old, our desire would be to have Christ. We think of Noah building an ark to the saving of his house. We think of the great danger that there was and the great solution that was provided. We see Christ as the one to whom we turn and the one to whom we run, the one in whom we find safety, the ark of the New Testament, the one who can cover us the wrath of God. How we pray blessing then upon each one of us as we come, our homes and our families. We bring them again before you, particularly those who are unwell, those with difficulties, sadnesses, sorrows, trials, temptations, those who have had difficult weeks in the past, perhaps those who are facing difficulty in this coming week. Who have issues and matters that they can see as it were coming up in life and causing yeah. a great concern. We confess, O oh Lord, that often we are like the disciples that we were considering today, that we are at times so unsure <laughs> when the answer is there in front. How often we fall back on our own resolve. How often we try to solve the problems ourselves and how often we fail to go first to the one who has shown us time and again his power, his grace and his all sufficiency. We praise thy name, O Lord, for the gospel of God's redeeming grace, that for sinners there is a way of redemption, 
that we can know peace with God and that we can live in that confidence that when we come to die, it will be to be with the Lord, for our sins are covered, our guilt is removed, and we have a hope that extends beyond the grave. We give thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his coming into this world, for the life that he lived and the death that he died. No ordinary death. It was a death of substitution. He had no sin to put to his account. He had no guilt, no shame, no shortcoming. He was the beloved son in whom the father was well pleased. And yet he takes the guilt and the penalty and the shame of his people. And he carries it as only he could carry it. Carrying it in grace. Carrying it in compassion. In pity. In love. In loving kindness. Oh, eternal Lord, we give thanks for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks that he lives to enable sinners to repent and to trust him. He ever lives to give repentance and remission of sins. He is the one in his grace and in his goodness to whom we can flee. Remember then now lives of a community as the gospel as all the work that will be done in the congregation here over the year much will be said and done activities there will be many for those who are spared to see but we are conscious that unless the lord builds the house the laborers work in vain and lord that we would not work in vain but that behind our working, the Lord would be working. Behind our activity, the Lord would be acting. And behind our speaking, the Lord would be speaking. Speaking to hearts and lives and souls. Convicting and converting. Establishing, edifying, sanctifying. Bringing on in grace those he has brought to taste of his goodness and grace. When we pray for ourselves, we pray for the other congregations around us in the present. To our north and to our east, to our south, we pray, Lord, for them. Particularly those that begin the year, pastorless and vacant. We pray of the wider church. We remember our work and mission, whether it be home mission in its differing forms or foreign mission in its differing forms. We remember the work in Sri Lanka and other aspects of the gospel under our king. We pray, Lord, for the church under persecution. We forget them very often. But we are thankful that the Lord does not. And there's little that we can do for them. The Lord is able to do for them. More than we can ask, more than they can think. Bring relief, bring help, and bring blessing. In the midst of very hard um, situation, we pray for again for those who govern. We leave all of that in thine own hand. There is much that we would wish were otherwise. But the Lord ultimately reigns. He is able to turn things around, to take good out of much that is bad. We pray blessing eternal one upon uh, the. Uh, worship, how time of worship now. Help us to sing to God's praise. To find in the words as we sing now. Something of our own experience. As we read, may we sense the authority of the word. As we consider the word, may we feel its piercing blade glance. Saying to us, as Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Don't look elsewhere. Don't look any further. It's talking about yourself. May that be true of us all. Go before us now. Cleanse us from every sin. The sins that are outward. The sins we know of. The secret sins of our heart. Sins that we scarce know. We break the law again and again. 
The law is holy and just and good. It's so delicate. And we are so indelicate. But ah, we pray, yeah. Lord, that it would all be under the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over. May it be so. For Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs> When we read together now in God's Word in the Scriptures of the Old Testament, Scriptures of the Old Testament and Book of Second Samuel, in chapter 12, you'll remember, just towards the end of last year, we consider together at some length the sad, sad events of chapter 11. We're going to come now to chapter 12. Second Samuel and chapter 12. And we shall read from um, the beginning. <clears throat> and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had brought up which he had brought and nourished up which he had bought sorry, and nourished up and it grew up together with him and with his children and it eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as i got pet lamb of um, great sentimental attachment and there came a traveller to the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him, and dressed their means, and killed it, and dressed it for, as, 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 as a meal, for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given to thee such and such things. When for hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah, Uriah the Pitta, to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly. But I will do this thing before all is And before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born of him shall surely do. And Nathan departed unto his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare to David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. 
The elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. It came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake to him, and he would not hearken to our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? When David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. He changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. When he required, they said, Bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants to him, what thing is this that thou hast done? It is fast and weep for the child, which was when it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not turn to me. We trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing, the reading of his word. But I'm seeking the light of God's Spirit on his word, being. Turn again to that passage that we <coughs> read together, Second Samuel and chapter 12. And this evening we will be considering together the first six or seven verses of the chapter. We'll read a verse four just to set it in a little context for us again. And it came a traveler to the rich man. And he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd the dress for the wayfaring man that was come to him. But took the poor man's lamb, dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that had done this thing shall surely die. Well, we have spent, I think, some four weeks tracing the sad events of chapter 11. Now, between the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12, about a year has passed. We know that because in chapter 12, the child is born. So, two a year passes between the events and recorded in 11 and those recorded in 12. And during that year, no intervention comes from the Lord. Despite the gravity of David's sin, and it was exceedingly and extremely rare, a grave, I mean, despite that, nothing seems to happen. You know, sometimes and maybe when we're younger, this happens more. I don't know. As we get older, we get harder or colder. But sometimes when we're younger and you do something wrong, you said, and you, you, you frighten something's going to happen straight away. And you think, well, no, I, I'm frightened. And maybe you might even be, be worried about sleeping at night because of things. But then it passes and nothing happens. Well, that's maybe how David was. He's secure in the palace. <laughs> Nothing has happened. Life goes on as it was before. And maybe, maybe David thought that things would continue like that. That he would 
get off with it, if you like. But nothing would happen. But that's all about to end. The Lord is in a hurry, you see. And the Lord can come and deal with us perhaps a long time after the initial events. Well, we know David is told that he is a visitor. The visitor is somebody he knows very well. He is Nathan the prophet. Prophets, of course, in the Old Testament, they did two things. Sometimes they would foretell. They would tell events that were yet to come. But more often than not, they were preachers who brought the message of God's word to the people. Many of them would travel about in their preaching and they would visit various places. Well, this particular day, Nathan is told, eh, David is told, that Nathan has come to visit. So there are four things in these verses that I want us to focus on. I used to begin by noticing, first of all, the prophet's visit. And there are three things about the prophet's visit that draw our attention here. First of all, as far as Nathan was concerned, it was an unappealing visit. It was an unappealing visit. It can't have been easy for him to go and visit the king on this occasion. It was unappealing, first of all, at a personal level. He had a message to deliver to a man who was his friend, with whom he had agreed on many things, and with whom, no doubt, he had cooperated on many things. He looked up to David, and David, in his better days, would have looked up to Nathan. They would have depended in good measure on each other. He was a colleague. He was a brother in the Lord for years. And who knows? All we read is that the Lord sent Nathan and Nathan came. Who knows what temptations Nathan had to deal with and grapple with as he made his way to see David. Temptations to turn back home. Temptations to tone down the message. Oh, it would have been unappealing at a personal level. And Nathan has been tested here, you see, as well. Will his loyalty to the law override everything else? Will it override the ties of friendship and of kinship? Will faithfulness to the Lord be what Nathan is about? Or will he allow other things? To affect him. And the Lord tests us as well, just in the same way. He tests us to see whether we are more faithful to Him or to other people, or what we're really going to follow God's way or our own way. The more difficult way or the easy way, but the easy way that slips away from the things of God. God tests us, and maybe, maybe as you think about your own life, you can. Can realize that that's the case, maybe even this week itself. Maybe there were things in this past week, and you, you say, well, that's exactly how it was. Maybe they weren't in the past week. Maybe they're waiting for you tomorrow. It was an unappealing visit at a personal level, but it was also an unappealing visit at a practical level. Nathan is going to visit the king. His royal master. Kings in those days had tremendous power. Many of them used it badly, but even the ones that didn't use it badly, they still had a huge amount of power. He's going to visit a man who has slipped far away spiritually from the place he should be. David is not walking with the Lord anymore. He was a man who had already killed somebody over this very issue. Imagine if the Lord sent you to, to, to speak to somebody, direct, 
frankly, another person has killed someone over that very issue. You're going to have to speak to him about it. Nathan probably had no idea how David would respond. He could have responded with denial. He could have flown into a rage. He could have even resorted to violence. It's never easy to be faithful to the Lord. God, as I said earlier, will test us and try us. And bring situations about where he sees what our temperature is. Is it warm to warm? Or is it cold? It's never easy to speak God's word. Never easy to be faithful to the Lord. And there's always a temptation from Satan to be quiet, to be silent, to tone it down. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul asks for prayer. Now we think of the Apostle Paul, he's as bold as a lion. But he was a man like everybody else. And he says this, He's asking for prayer. For me, he says, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, as I said, we think of the Apostle Paul, and we think he's as bold as a lion. Mm -hmm. He hardly needs prayer. <clears throat> oh, no, says Paul. I stand in great need of prayer, so that I will be bold, so that I need compromise, so that I need step down. From where I should be. And if. Well if Paul needed it. Every preacher of the gospel needs it. You see I don't know what to pray for. As far as ministers are concerned. Well there's a prayer. For this very week. They would open their mouth. For me. Because the temptation. Not to do it. Is huge. It is a costly thing. It cost Nathan. That visit cost him. No doubt the Lord blessed him for his faithfulness. So it was an unappealing visit, but we notice as well, it was an undeserved visit. What did David deserve to get? Well, I think it's A.W. Pink, he says. He probably deserved his enemies to invade him. He could have woken up one morning and heard that Maybe the Ammonites had invaded and crossed the border and were causing havoc. He even deserved the messenger of death to come and summon him, so that he stands before God to give his account. God doesn't send a soldier to kill him. He sends a preacher to warn him. He sends a preacher to warn him. Oh, he did the same for you, Christian. How often did you cross the line? And yet he spared you. And in your case, he sent preachers to warn you who would speak to you the word of God and who would bring blessing in their way. What a mercy, what a kindness, what a kindness that still is. David is going to be revived. David is going to be brought back. It was an undeserved visit. Isn't it always? And if the Lord visits us and if he extends to us his kindness in the gospel, you remember and me with you. We don't deserve it. Never ever get to the place where we think we deserve it. We do. Kindness is shown to him, but he never showed to your eye. The Lord is far kinder to him than he was to the other one. We're going to sing in Psalm 103 later, with us he dealt not as we sin. Here's an example of it. Indeed. From a prophet's visit, it's unappealing. It's undeserved. But thirdly, <clears throat> it was unasked for. It was unsought. David doesn't send for Nathan. He doesn't sit down one day and write a letter and say, Nathan, I'm in a bad way spiritually. I've wandered away from the Lord and my heart is as cold as ice and I have no communion with God. 
Please come, I must discuss the situation with me. Not at all. The days pass and the weeks pass. And David doesn't lift a finger to do anything. He was now in greater need of hearing God's word. He doesn't send for Nathan. Verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. <clears throat> we never seek the Lord until he seeks us. It's another way, Christian, again it was with yourself, as you reflect on your own spiritual past and the way the Lord brought you. It wasn't you that went seeking, it was him that went seeking. Maybe you were trying to go in the opposite direction. The Lord sought you. He found you. He touched your heart. He brought you to himself. You see, the Lord isn't passive here. He's active. He's graciously active. P.R. Davis is a lovely phrase in connection with this, and he calls it God's vigilance of grace. God's vigilance of grace. God is keeping vigil, watch over David, and it's a watch of grace and of kindness and of mercy. Oh, God's God in his grace, what does he do? He pursues the sinner. And he exposes his sin to him and to God. But he does so. Not to crush them. But ultimately to draw them to himself. And when his people go astray, he does the same thing. He pursues them. He does not let his people sit comfortably in their sin and in their backsliding. And David is seriously backslidden of he will not let them do that indefinitely. A week may pass, a month may pass, a year may pass. But sooner or later, Nathan will come knocking. Sooner or later, the Lord will stir up some activity. And things will begin to rise. What a blessing that God didn't abandon him. And he didn't say, well, David, you have crossed the line and crossed it so severe, so severe, that I wash my hands off. By mercy, that's, that's not how he is. Christian, how many times? Oh, you didn't cross the line as David, perhaps. No, perhaps about it. There's a gravity here which is unusual. But the principle is the same. Many a time he could have left you. Left you where you were. But he sought you. To be seeking you now. Pursuing you now when you feel it. Satan says to you, try to, to ignore it. My friend, don't do that, whatever you do. Mm. If he had done that, where would you be tonight? If he had done that, where will you be? Where will you be? Well, the prophets listened. But then secondly, as we look at the verses, we see the prophets. Ah. Now, as we've seen, it was a difficult task for Nathan to face. We're not told the details, but no doubt he was much in prayer. He would have prayed to the Lord. He was probably praying every step of the way. He was praying in his heart secretly. As he comes to the door of the palace, he's ushered in to see the king, and they have whatever pleasantries they had. And he's praying, Lord, 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 help. Lord, help. Give me words. Give me wisdom. And the Lord does. He guides Nathan. In a remarkable way. Nathan is led to approach the matter. Not head on. Now sometimes you have to approach things head on. Don't approach the matter head on at all. He begins by telling the king a story. 
Your Majesty, he says, I have something that I want to tell you about. And he tells him about this man, who was a very poor man, as we see in verse 3. He had absolutely nothing. But somehow he managed to get enough money together to buy one little new lamb. No doubt, hoping from that one new lamb, maybe to build up some sort of flock. So the little new lamb became, as it almost inevitably would, a pet. And it was greatly loved by the family and greatly loved by the children. And it's, it's one of the family. Sometimes happens with these lambs, doesn't it? There's another man who lived nearby. He was a rich man. He had a huge amount of livestock. And he is a visitor. The practice in the East in those days was that if you had a visitor, uh, they didn't have the freezes and things like that. Uh, keeping a meat was very difficult. So you simply, when the visitor came, you uh, took the animal and they got the meat ready in that way. Despite the fact that he had a huge amount of stock and no end of sheep himself, and no doubt a, a good collection of, of, of lambs well brought on and maybe a kind few wedders as well. What does he do? He goes down and he takes the other fellows. He gives instructions for it to be killed. And is served up to his rich Yes. <laughs> He stole all that the poor man had for one little man. And Nathan appeals to David. David was the supreme judge in the land. Uh, Your Majesty, what do you think? What do I think? He said. One of us drawn into the story. He obviously thinks it was an actual case that had occurred. You see what happened? Nathan doesn't give judgment against David. He allows David to get drawn in. And before long, David will judge himself. David will judge himself. The prophet's visit, the prophet's parable, Thirdly, the prophet's effect. What do you think, your majesty? What do I think, he said? I'll tell you what I think. David is appalled by the story. He's shocked. You notice in verse 5, he becomes seriously religious. As the Lord liveth. Let's bring the Lord into the whole equation. As the Lord liveth, Nathan. Oh, this is a sinful matter. This is done in the sight of God. God has seen this and it is a terrible thing. He becomes seriously religious and he becomes gravely judicial. Verse 5. Man that has done this thing will surely die. Verse 6, he will restore the lamb fourfold. He will restore the lamb fourfold. He said the rich man would take four lambs of equal quality, four ewe lambs for the poor man. But actually, he said, this man is going to have to die. And he said, there's, there's no two ways about it. Not only because of the theft, but he tells us in verse 6, because he had no pity. He said, this man has crossed the line. This is a theft way above any ordinary theft. This man is cold and heartless and cruel. It calls for the highest penalty that the law can give. <clears throat> Not Nathan. What I think. Do you think? 
how blind we can be to our own sin. How blind we can be to our own sin. We don't see it all. We're blind at times, even when it's described for. Isn't this a reminder of how dull and dead and fast asleep our conscience can be? He hears the story. The application is obvious. But it goes over his head. Do you notice? And Nathan must have thought. I'm not told what Nathan thought, but you would think he would have thought, well, before I've got I've got two sentences into this, David's going to, to realize what, what I'm doing. And certainly before I reach the end of the parable, David is going to be wise to it. And he's going to say, Nathan, what are you trying to say? Nathan, he said, as the Lord lives, there's going to be judgment on us. How low our spiritual discernment can become. This was a man of God. And he wasn't a juvenile. He wasn't a young believer struggling with ethical issues. He wasn't an inexperienced believer. He was somebody who had been following the Lord for many years. Friend, don't think that because you've been a Christian for many years, you're immune. Not a given. His spiritual discernment is gone. This was a man who was in no good for his discernment. A man who had a very keen conscience. You remember when, when, he, when he cuts the corner of Saul's robe as proof that he had been close enough to kill him. He felt he guilty about it. He said, I shouldn't have done it, he said. Across the line. He was a man with a, a tender conscience. He's snuffling his conscience. He's, he's putting a pillow over his conscience. And you know, it wasn't as if this happened the day after. He's had a year to think about, it, a year to ponder. It. And considering how great these two sins were, it's a wonder he went a year without repenting. It's a reminder to us of what I said the last time, that repentance is the work of God's Spirit. You think repentance is easy? I tell you, it's impossible without the work of God. People sometimes say, well, you know, when I, when I come to die, when I'm close to the end, I'll repent. That's a great error. You are assuming you have the power to do it. And I do it. The Lord's enabling. We will remain as hard and cold and oblivious as David was. Let's do it all for we haven't repented. It appears that David wasn't happy. Of course he was. Good things happen, as I said earlier. But in his heart of hearts, he's not happy. This is a man who walked closely with the Lord. And now there's a cloud between himself and his God. Most commentators tie Psalm 32 to this, and I touched on that when we were singing. Outwardly things are going on as before, but inwardly he's unhappy. He's dry as a cork. My moisture is turned to the summer heat. I'm dry, I'm hard, I'm, I'm, I'm everything I shouldn't be. No communion with God. There was silence between himself and God. Real silence. Maybe he, he was going through the motions. And you can go through the motions. That's all it is. Let's 
can somebody come to this position? Well, uh, I came across something quite helpful on this just recently. It was by um, a comment actually by, by the late Reverend Alex McPherson, who you may who was a minister in the Free Presbyterian Church, and he's speaking about this period in David's life. And he points out that the Christian can fail to repent of sin for two reasons. First of all, because of our lack of self-examination. We're commanded to, to examine ourselves. In David's case, the sin was so obvious, and uh, Mr. McGregor says it, and I agree with him, it is so obvious that it didn't require much search. It wasn't as though he, he needed to examine his heart deeply. This was lying on the surface. So it's not a lack of self-examination, although he certainly wasn't engaging in self-examination. There's more than that. And the other factor is this, the deceitfulness of our hearts. And I'm talking here about the Christian. We are capable, are we not, instead of forsaking and mourning over sin, of saying, well, it's nothing. It's not so bad. I, I, I cannot but suspect that David was doing exactly that. It's not so bad. It could be worse. And you, you can excuse anything. David could excuse murder. And that's what seems to have happened here. David has brushed it away. He's pushed it out of his mind. I and mean, it's gone so far out of his mind. And Nathan tells his power. He probably continued to excuse it. In any case, he is so blind to the reality, he doesn't recognize it. God's word is preached. Do you see yourself in it? God's word is like a mirror. As you read God's word, as God's word, do you see yourself in it? And do you say, that's me. That's exactly me. Do you see certain things, maybe in the lives of other people in the Bible, or maybe just in the general teaching of the Bible? And you say, that's me. I'm looking at myself. Or do you say like David? None of this applies to me. Well, that's how David was. He said, none of that applies to me. How blind we can be to our own sin. It's a danger. But the, the deceitfulness of our heart, our failure to self-examination. This is a, a frightening episode. And in some ways, this chapter and David's blindness to it all, it almost frightens me more than the previous chapter. Things can happen fast and in a hurry, but yeah, no. this is a grave listen us here. How blind we can be to our own sin, but how hard we can be on the sins of others. Listen, this is a feature of us as well. We minimize our sin, we maximize others. We we'll excuse things in ourselves. Oh, woe betide the person who catches our eye and we perceive the sin. David explodes in anger. He goes further than was necessary. It was an overreaction. He said, the man is going to die. Well, really? Is that really He's done a horrible thing. The king requires restitution. He overreacts. He overreacts at the sin of somebody else. And he underreacts at his own. The deceitfulness of the heart. We don't know the heart of it, friend. He goes further than was necessary. He goes far further than the Lord did. 
Exodus 22, verse 1, the restitution for the stolen sheep was fourfold. You steal it, you give four. That's all the law said. No more. David's adding to the law. David's adding to God's law. Even as he's breaking it, he's adding to it. He's falling back on a sort of legalism here, actually. He's becoming excessively legalistic, even at the same time as he's forgetting his own heart and his own soul. And you sometimes see that. Well, we've had the prophet's visit, the prophet's parable, the prophet's effect. What about the prophet's application? Verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. David, the man in the parable is you. Have you come to that place? Where you say, I'm the man. I'm the man. I see myself. I don't see the people down the road or this person or that. I see myself. And it sends me to the Lord for forgiveness and pardon and grace. I am the man. Before anybody else, it's me. Alexander White says, speaking about the conscience, Nathan's sword, he said, was an inch from David's conscience. Before David knew, Nathan even had a sword. And from all this comes Psalm 51. With its heartfelt, broken confession and its plea for mercy. We shall have to return because our time now is gone. When David is mercifully delivered from complacency and spiritual lethargy, the Lord rescues him. Though he didn't deserve it and he didn't even want it, he didn't seek it in, the Lord comes. But we're going to discover in the following verses, lest anybody say, well, I can sin then, and God will restore him. God's people can't sin with impunity. Chastisement will follow. And it does follow in this case. And it's a soul one. But that's for another day. If we're spared. David, the man in the parable. It's yourself. <clears throat> it's myself. It's yourself. You see it. And God bless his heart. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, we stand before the holiness of God and we see something here of the slippery deceitfulness of our own heart. Where can we go but where David went? To the Lord with a confession of sin and a plea for mercy. To pardon our iniquity. <clears throat> but it is very great. And we come with the assurance that for Christ's sake if we confess our sins truly, truly, if we turn from them and forsake them, he will pardon and he will receive for the sake of Christ. Be with us in our closing praise. And watch over us in the week as it unfolds for Christ's sake. Amen. Yes.